The best part is, it's not that noticeable. Welcome to Questions Over Coffee. Today I am still drinking my favorite blend from Avoca. This is a single origin that they manufacture. This Avoca brand is out of Fort Worth. They're very local to us and they have subscriptions available. If you're interested, highly recommend their coffee. It's what we buy here at the office. Avoca. So first question comes from Brandon L over Facebook. I'm trying to start an emergency document kit, things like passport, social security cards, pictures, thumb drives, etc. I was hoping to have something I can keep in my gun safe in case of emergency to grab and go, like where your head's at. Uh, I'm wondering if you had any advice on products like binders, folders, or document holders, binders full of women, <laughs> that are uh, waterproof, fireproof, that you could recommend and maybe shed some light on things that you keep. So I have something similar. It's on a hard drive though, rather than on a flash drive. So that's something that I keep in our safe that I can grab like that. Also utilize cloud resources too. Those are something that don't get talked about enough because people are fearful of putting that kind of data on the cloud. But in all actuality, if something happens and your, your house gets lifted up by a tornado or something catastrophic happens and you can't get to those documents, if that's your only source of having those is physically grabbing them, um, you may really be kind of screwing yourself with that. So, um, there are some encrypted ways of storing some of that stuff online in the cloud, so you might want to look into that as well, and that's something I'd highly recommend for that kind of data, because then if you're forced to leave your home, you can still access that kind of information from any kind of laptop, provided you have the login information. So um, if you do some kind of password management, like put everything into a 1Password application, make sure that you know that 1Password so that you can get into 1Password and get your password for your online cloud stuff, so just a recommendation. Um, and then when it comes to actually waterproofing and fireproofing things, um, you know, that's sometimes a consideration with fireproof safes is that stuff like that can still get waterlogged. Um, you know, the, the safe itself, the door, is not always a tight seal. Sometimes there's holes in the bottom of the safe for mounting. If you don't have yours mounted down, I would highly recommend it. Definitely mount it to the slab wherever you put it. Um, so that it's less likely to walk away during a, a burglary or a theft situation. But those holes that are there can allow water to come up through there too. So it, it is a consideration to keep in mind. You might want to just use something like an lock sack bag or something to that effect. However, there's always the risk of, you know, the high temperature of a fire, you know, potentially melting that bag and compromising what's in it. So, you know, they, Fireproof manufacturers like to say that they have a high melting point so that you're not going to experience things like that. But however, I just, I don't know, I don't really trust that. So, you know, the hard drive I have is, is heat rated. So that's something you might want to look at too when you're talking about that. And then also look at the, um, in your safe as well, you'll have some type of uh, time value that's associated with the temperature that's on the safe manufacturer. So a lot of them are 30 minute fire rated, some are 60 minutes, some are 90 minutes, some are even 120 minutes. So you might want to look into that too and make sure you have something that can withstand the, the temperature and, and heat that will be associated with a fire in the event something happens. So just some pointers to look into. Hopefully that answers your question. One more thing that I thought of on this last question is you're talking about documents and keeping them in something. You might want to look into a secondary small fireproof safe and put the documents in there and then have that in your larger safe so that you can grab it and go and that that stuff is still protected because I know some of those smaller ones can be uh, waterproof as well. So just a little tip on that. All right, so next question comes from Rick, R-I-K on Twitter. What are your suggestions for rucking shoes or boots? Would you choose the Renegades or sport shoes? So. I've been through a couple of different things when I go ruck or something like that. So um, when I'm hiking or rucking, whatever you consider it, um, I've got pretty much two de facto types of shoes that I wear depending on what I'm doing. Um, if I'm hiking with a substantial amount of weight for a substan substantial amount of time, I always choose my lower Renegades. Um, these are the leather line version of the Renegades and not the GTX or the um, Gore-Tex line versions. I do not like Gore-Tex for reasons I've already gone over plenty of times, but leather lined is great. Uh, it keeps the smell down and 
Uh, I just deal with kind of the, the ramifications of not having waterproofness on my boots, which I think is a little bit of a misnomer anyway. Um, and then I also like these Speed Assaults from Solomon. Um, I really had good luck with these shoes. They've got a really aggressive tread that hasn't worn out like some of the other Solomons that I've had before. Um, and they have this ankle support, which I like. It's kind of a three-quarter or mid-rise ankle. Uh, but it's got, I got a stretchy material back here too, which is really nice. Um, on ankles when you're when you're hiking but the thing though is I have found that my feet aren't as comfortable in these over prolonged periods of time I definitely feel uh, large rocks and stuff like that more in these than I do uh, my lower renegades so I always just kind of keep coming back to the renegades more so even than the, the Solomon speed assaults so there you go okay next question is from Kat G on YouTube did you put this in here how are you so untouched by life? I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, does that mean that I don't really know what's going on most days? Because you'd probably be right with that assumption, but I don't know. Untouched by life. I'll have to think about that one. I don't have an answer for you right now. Let's move on. So Thomas over email. This is a tremendously long question. Look at this. There's more down here. <laughs> All right, so Thomas over email, I'm currently employed as a teacher in a private school where, care, where, where teacher carry is not permitted. We have some security plans in place, but nothing worth putting your faith in. I want to get your take on how best to be prepared for an active shooter or any type of social violence scenario in a place where I cannot have my carry weapon. While I still subscribe to the run, hide, fight mentality, I have room behind the reception area uh, and have always figured that if something happened here, we would immediately be able to run and we would be lucky to realize the situation in time to implement our door barricade. That's good you have a barricade. Excuse me, my current resources are this. Employees are not kept from carrying knives, so I carry a legal limit pocket folder with assisted opening I'm comfortable with. I always have some form of flashlight on me. I keep a tourniquet in my side pocket during the day uh, as a personal tourniquet. It carries well and doesn't draw attention. In my bag, I also carry a med kit and tourniquet quick. Thank you on the strap with a soft TW. Uh, lastly, this is where I think I might have gone off the rails. I have an agent deployable plate carrier with 10 by 12 level four plates and trauma pads. I'm in the process of putting together an ITS fat boy to go on the front with two stat tourniquets, chest seals, and cell locks. That's a lot of information. Let me attempt to distill this a little bit. So uh, first of all, if you are in a place where you can't carry, um, I would definitely recommend a lot of the steps that you've already gone over. So the fact that you even have a bag that you're ready to go with that's got plates in it, I think it's a, a fantastic resource. However, just know that in the event of having to run and get away, you really need to be able to move quickly with that weight. So depending on what you're doing, I would maybe have something as a situation where the backpack that you have set up, there is a smaller go bag within that bag so that if you find you're in a situation where you just need to run as quickly as you can, you might want to open that up, grab the smaller lightweight bag and, and book. Um, however, if you're comfortable moving with the amount of weight that you probably have combined with plates and all the other stuff you're carrying in there, that's fine too. Just realize that um, you need to kind of make that a consideration if you haven't already. And you might have already done that. So um, what I will say is that I think you're very prepared when it comes to medical stuff. I think that's great. Um, that's a thing that's at the top of my list too, is making sure I have um, trauma stuff readily available and accessible um, to treat anybody around me and myself if I had to. That's a huge consideration. The flashlight is a huge thing too. Um, you really need to be ready for you know, a power down scenario or something like that where you can't see. Um, I might recommend tossing in a headlamp too. That could be a, a great way to have hands free light if you need to actually evacuate or move out. Um, and it's dark. Um, and then a couple more things that you might want to think about in this kind of scenario is that more than likely you may be dealing with just even a, a natural disaster or a fire or something like that too. So um, I like these Blaze Defense products. So these are small fire suppression devices. Uh, they're very easy to pack and hold. They're super lightweight, uh, but you could put out a fire, you, a small fire that you may encounter on your way uh, egressing out of a building or something like that. So that might be something to think about too. And then um, the thing that I've been kind of working through myself personally is that I just picked up a couple of these on eBay. So these are uh, formerly from the Secret Service. They're expired and somebody's selling them surplus on eBay, but they are uh, 
they were escape hoods basically. So the Secret Service developed these protocols for having something that's you know roughly I don't know maybe the size of an MRE or something like that. But this is actually an oxygen powered escape hood. So we've actually done something years ago on escape hoods, and I've really I've never really subscribed to them being the best of of both worlds in terms of what you would need in a scenario like that where you're trying to get out of a smoke filled environment or um, just something where there's there's even gas in the area so I do have some some notes that I wanted to read on these things because I think they're fascinating and I'm actually going to open this up and kind of show you what the deal is I will, I will sacrifice one of these because I need to do it anyway I haven't opened up one of these and if I'm going to kind of stake my life on it a little bit I want to know what's in them anyway but so these are uh, victim rescue units or VRUs uh, they were manufactured in 2002, and they have a shelf life that expired in 2013. However, um, they've got a 10 plus year expiration date, and my feeling on stuff that's expired is I would rather be able to have something like this than not have anything at all, because these things cost in the neighborhood. From my research online, I found that the new ones were selling for like 800 bucks, and that may be to the government or something like that, but these are, I, got, I picked these up for like 20 bucks a piece on eBay, so just make sure you save me one because I got to replace this if you're going to buy them all. <laughs> um, so these, the specs on this is lightweight self-contained SX victim rescue unit VRU plus self-contained protective breathing system. Um, in emergency egress and escape situations, it takes seconds to don providing 360 degree visibility while supplying aviator grade oxygen. This victim rescue unit protects your respiratory system and delivers head and vision from fire, toxic fumes, hazardous chemical spills plus sarin or mustard gases for up to 60 minutes. I don't think we're going to necessarily encounter sarin or mustard gases, but hey, it's good to know it protects against them. Supplies oxygen via an aviator grade compressed oxygen O2 cylinder with overpressure protection to prevent rupture. So I've, uh, somebody turned me on to these and I really started looking into them and um, I just kind of finally bit the bullet on eBay and ordered some. I really wanted to make sure that I had, I'm going to keep two of these in every vehicle that we have and then I'm going to keep two at home too just for having to egress in the event of a fire or something like that too. So um, just let me read you kind of the instructions on putting this on first. So what they say is that, that you've got a easy way to just open it with the red tabs here. So you just pull it open. Um, then you take the VRU hood with the neck seal facing you. You grasp the oxygen bottle in your right hand and red ball in the left hand. Pull apart sharply. So let's just go ahead and open it. All right, so this is the mask. Doesn't smell bad. I guess that's a good thing. So uh, one thing I forgot to mention, there's this little dot on here. So if it's pink, it means that it's been, um, what does it say? So if the humidity indicator turns pink, the unit should be removed from service within 36 hours. So that means that they haven't been exposed to humidity, which is good. It's been in a sealed package. So that's one thing you want to look for. All right. So let's see. What does it say here? Grasp the oxygen bottle in right hand and red ball in left hand. There's a red ball in the left hand right there. The lever must pull free of the oxygen bottle with palms together pull apart. Okay. So then you, you pop the oxygen seal and then you open it up. So this is the next seal right here, this rubber piece. All right. So let's, uh Oh, better put this on. Okay. I do have 360 degree visibility. I feel like ET. Can you hear me? All right. All right, so it says, uh, while wearing the hood, audible hiss tells you oxygen is flowing. If you still don't hear the hiss after the lever has been removed, remove the unit immediately from your head and notify trained personnel. I feel it filling up. Wow. I can see pretty good. I mean, it is kind of an amber color, so that's good for shooting situations, right? In the sun. All right, breathe normally, await further instructions from trained personnel. Remove hood after you're clear or hazard or instructed by trained personnel. So one thing I wanted to mention is that it says that, where's the time value on this? Okay, so it supplies oxygen for up to 15 minutes of high intensity activity or up to 60 minutes of stationary breathing while waiting for rescue. So, you go ahead and fix it up. That's pretty freaking cool. Still going. 
So you can see the, the neck seal hasn't been compromised. I could feel it definitely sealing on my neck as well. I guess we can kind of open this up. So that's the, that's the O2 bottle right here. By the way, these are done for once they've been opened, so. So there's a, there's the O2 hose right there feeding into the mask. So clean for oxygen service. Yeah, so there's your oxygen canister right there. I was looking for a gram weight on it, but made in Japan on the oxygen first. I think these are probably made in the U.S. I think they probably have to be. However, the oxygen looks to be made in Japan. But I wanted to kind of show you guys that. I've been kind of experimenting with having some of these myself, so I thought I'd kind of fill you guys in on it. And I think it's a great tie-in to this question, and this is absolutely something to keep in a go bag, too. So, Thanks for watching Questions Over Coffee. Remember, use the pound tag gear tasting in a social media network, and we will find them and get them answered here on the show. Remember to subscribe if you aren't already subscribed. We would love your subscription here on YouTube. And if you are subscribed, take a look through your preferences and check the little notification thing so you can be the first to know when we have a new video. This thing's still going. So I'm going to see how long this goes.